Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Rosa Nuvini. I'm one of the co-founders of Emotions Matter. Um, and you are here today attending the Expression of Music and Arts as Advocacy Panel. Uh, We're delighted you can join us. Um, I'll be moderating this panel. Uh, while I'm doing the introductions, we invite you to write in the chat where you're joining us from. So if you can say, hello everyone, I'm from City State, greetings. It would be just great to see where everybody's coming from today. So a little bit of, um, just a little bit of background on Emotions Matter. So let me see if I can get this right. I'm gonna try to share my screen. We've been having a little bit of issues with Mac, but I think I got it. Um, all right, second, share, window. Okay. Can everybody see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. All right. So for those of you that don't know what we do at Emotions Matter, our mission is um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 2014, uh, 2015 to support, educate, and advocate for those impacted by borderline personality disorder. Our vision is to create a world in which every person with BPD has access to treatment and resources to achieve a meaningful recovery. Our website is www.emotionsmatterbpd.org. And we are, given that we are a nonprofit, all of our funding for programming and everything that we've been doing the last few years and in the future comes from donations. So if you all feel like you want to donate to us today or sometime in the future, uh, please feel, feel free to visit our website. You are really the only reason that we can keep things going. So we appreciate it and no donation is too small. So our philosophy is we strive to create a safe, judgment-free space for people with BPD. We accept that there is a spectrum of experiences within the BPD community. We honor where people are on their journey without judgments or assumptions. We encourage people to define their own path towards recovery. We speak as experts of our own lived experience, not as medical experts. So guidelines for community engagement. So as you know, there's a Q&A box. It's not a chat. So please put comments that can be made in the chat box, like questions you have or any feedback. Um, please use respectful language in the session chat. We accept difference and promote acceptance, especially with regard to gender, sexual orientation, identity, race, ethnicity, age, religion, disability, or politics. Avoid explicit expressions of self-harm or trauma, which may be upsetting to others. We ask you to please seek medical help if you are feeling that at this time. Um, panels and plenary sessions will be recorded and available after the conference. No screenshots or recording on personal devices, please. So, if at any time during BPD Fest, you find yourself overwhelmed, struggling, or for any reason in need of support, we encourage you to reach out to your support team. Audience members may experience intense and painful emotions, feelings, memories, thoughts, or reactions to content shared. Please participate at your own risk. You're always welcome to take a break from BPD Fest at any time or withdraw from it entirely. In the event of a medical emergency, please seek care through a doctor hospital emergency, such as 911. So as I said before, this is our, if you'd like to make a donation, please make a donation here. And uh, we have another amazing event coming up in New York City on Sunday, June 5th, where it's an in-person walk for BPD along the Hudson River Park. We have had these events in the past, which was put us, uh, we basically put a stop to it during COVID and now they're, they've come back. It's an amazing event where you can meet other people. There's a lot going on. You can walk, you can stand, you can do whatever, but it's a lot of fun. I encourage anyone that's around to come and attend. Okay, so I think we kind of went over just the conversation guidelines. So um, I'm not going to go over it again. And let's start. So I'm going to just start with some introductions. Um, let me just pull them up. Okay, so our first panel discussion is Alyssa G. She was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder in 2018, and since that time has devoted herself to recovery journey and to building a life worth living. In early 2021, Alyssa started an Instagram account called DBT Exchange for BPD content to build community through her humor hope, subsequently starting a blog by the same name. 
Great. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for having me here today and welcome to everybody who just came in. Uh, this journey began on Halloween of 2018 when I found myself on a jet blue flight flying from JFK, New York to Los Angeles, California. The pilot began speaking over the loudspeaker. What kind of witch loves the beach, he asked. A sandwich, that is. And with that, I was on my way to a partial hospitalization program for intensive therapy. During the previous year, I had hit rock bottom. I stopped working, stopped eating, stopped socializing and leaving the house. If hell was a place on earth, I knew it. It was pain that led me to fly across the country, both alone and afraid, to get help. While at this PHP program, I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. I had been experiencing every single symptom from suicidal ideation to severe mood swings to dissociative episodes and even paranoid thinking patterns. In my darkest hour, I even believed that the people who once loved me were now disgusted by me and possibly even wish me dead. But getting the BPD diagnosis was one of the single best things to ever happen to me. It allowed me to find an effective treatment program and become part of a community of people who understood me. That time in a PHP program gave me a sliver of hope that life could be worth living again. From laughing with new friends to going on hikes and swimming at the beach, it gave me a vision to aspire towards. After three months in treatment, I came back home to New York and immediately entered a comprehensive dialectical behavioral therapy program, DBT. This is when the real work began the daily grind of recovery. One turning point in my recovery came as I began doing trauma work with my therapist. Suddenly I was finding it easier to spend time with myself. This shift enabled me to get clean and sober with the help of Narcotics Anonymous. Instead of using substances to sedate myself, I began finding new ways to spend time alone through different creative outlets that fed my sense of self-respect. At first, I started taking online group guitar classes. It was fun having a new hobby, learning a new skill, and being around other people, especially because in-person activities were closed down due to COVID. I took classes four to five days a week, and that really helped me to stay sober. A few months later, I began an Instagram account called DBT Exchange as an advocate for borderline personality disorder. At first, I used my sense of humor to create funny memes that brought light to the daily happenings of living with BPD. The Instagram account began to grow and the posts ranged in topics from splitting to fear of abandonment in relationships to the mental health benefits of having a pet. I'm now going to share my screen, hopefully, and um, share some of my more popular posts with you. And uh, let me, okay, here we go. <laughs> And, you know, the first one that I decided to, to bring up was about BPD paranoia, you know, because that can often be a, one of the symptoms that's most isolating. But when you see like nearly a thousand followers heart this post, you know, you feel a lot less alone. And then, of course, you need the, uh, the cute animal, furry, fuzzy animal posts. That's an absolute must. And then I came out with this one after the uh, Amber Heard diagnosis because, you know, the BPD community was just so impacted by that diagnosis and I wanted to show my support. And there are times when I need support and I'm having a tough day and I'll post on the account and, uh, you know, people will really show their love and support. And then, of course, one more um, cute, fuzzy animal one. So... So these are just some of the memes that I have on my account. And, you know, so suddenly I had a community of people coming on this journey with me saying, you know, me too. I hear you. You're not alone. Thank you for posting this content and sharing your story. You know, there was a place for me to turn when I was having a difficult days. Followers would reach out with support and love, and I could do the same for them. Not only was this account giving voice to my experience, but it was also validating to other people because the chances are that if you're experiencing something, other people are too. I began making new friends and it gave me a sense of purpose and meaning. 
people were looking to me for hope and encouragement and I wanted to give it to them. Because writing has always been my main passion, I started a blog by the same name, DBT Exchange, in conjunction with the Instagram account where I could go even deeper into each topic. From dating with BPD, people seem to really like that topic of dating, uh, to self-sabotage, I delve into a range of topics and share from my firsthand experiences. Whether it's on Instagram or the blog, I can say things to members of the BPD community that the general population or even my friends not, might not necessarily understand. You know, I don't have to explain why I think the guy I'm dating will break up with me because his tone of voice has a slight annoyance in it, you know, because you get it. This is art created by someone with lived experience of BPD for people with BPD. And when people without BPD, like allies or family members, express that my content is helping them to better understand their loved one, that is the single greatest compliment I can receive, because that right there is advocacy. How, however you choose to express yourself, whether it be through music or on social media or through writing, all these outlets can be an opportunity to validate and normalize your experiences, gain insight, aid in your recovery, and connect with other people all while expressing your unique talents and sense of mastery. Each and every one of us has something important to add to the discussion. Thank you for allowing me to be part of that conversation today. That was wonderful, Alyssa. Um, we're gonna circle back with you with questions. Um, so we're gonna go through Lauren and Kaylee's presentations and then we're gonna open it up to a Q&A at large. I'll start with some questions and then we'll get questions from the audience. Um, okay. so. Lauren, uh, she is a DBT-oriented psychotherapist with a master's of science in mental health counseling. She believes that all individuals with BPD have the capacity to live their own version, vision of a life worth living. Lauren advocates for compassion, individualized, and non-stigmatizing interventions with mental health care. In her free time, Lauren enjoys creating art, writing, and expressing herself through her fashion. Lauren is driven to work on creating unique alternative approaches to therapy, as well as addressing and rectifying broken mental health care systems. Lauren's values of non-judgment, kindness, fairness, and out-of-the-box thinking are guiding factors in her career and her life. Take it away, Lauren. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so just forewarning, I did write some bullet notes. I will be looking at the screen uh, to try to have some foundation in what I'm saying. Um, but it's nice to meet you all. Um, you know, as Rosa said, I'm a master's level psychotherapist. And actually, at the moment, I will be expanding my degree into art therapy in a postgraduate program starting in September, which is a huge deal for me. This is something I've wanted and worked towards for so many years, and I never fully allowed myself to, you know, go for that vision. So this is a huge deal for me. Um, also, at the moment, I'm going to be starting a DBT certification to kind of like make that official. Um, so I have experience firsthand working on an inpatient unit at New York Presbyterian on the borderline unit. And I have to say, like, I had floated to many other units, but my favorite unit was the borderline unit. Um, just some of the most amazing people I've ever met and known and had interactions with. Um, I, you know, in my professional experience, I've just noticed that a lot of people misunderstand what borderline is, confuse it with multiple personalities or um, just have these really ugly stereotypes and stigmas. So, you know, part of what I want to do in my career is be someone who advocates for people with BPD and changes the narrative around people with BPD. And, you know, I mean, it could be through anything, through activism, through like this type of organization, but also just like correcting therapists I come across when they say things that are unknowingly offensive or, you know, lumping people into one category. Um, okay, so, you know, going into art. So for me, creative arts have helped me, obviously, finding a new way to work with patients. Um, you know, I, I do work also with autistic adults. And I so through that, I've kind of learned that Communication doesn't always have to be traditional or verbal. There's so many ways to communicate your feelings and express your feelings. Um, you know, especially with BPD, emotions can be so intense that it can be difficult to even articulate what's going on internally. It's just a point of overload. So, you know, I feel like art is a beautiful way to release and process and express. Um, within my personal journey, I have found art to be cathartic, and it has actually been the catalyst for embracing my most authentic identity which is a huge deal for me. I spent many years trying to feel like I had a solid sense of self. 
And art is the thing that really brought that to life in my own healing. Um, my art has a theme of like rainbows, iridescent, bright colors, celestial things, and a lot of symbolism. Um, so I feel like these are all visual reflections of who I feel I am within my soul and just beyond this physical body. Um, I am no Monet. <laughs> I want to make that very clear. I take pride in my art being abstract and messy um, because I'm not measuring myself by my skill level. It's more so about just my art being mine, uh, which is a very along the way. Um, but art has not only helped me embrace myself, but has helped me create consistency and grounding within my life. Overall, it's helped me be more introspected and dedicated to working through my own mental health struggles. Um, my earliest memory of getting involved with the arts actually traces back to my grandma. Um, she started buying me craft supplies from the time I was like three years old. I was cutting hearts out, everything. Um, so I was spending hours a day creating things, crafting, writing. Um, as I got older, I kind of fell into the comparison trap and my focus went elsewhere. I had low self-esteem um, because my art was so different. I didn't feel like I fit into that box. Um, when I was in high school, I took a 3D art class and I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, in college, I started having weekly craft nights with my friend. Uh, and within the past two years, I've really gotten into this stuff more than ever. I stopped holding myself back and I allowed myself to call myself an artist. I actually was in an art show with this organization. Um, and, you know, I make sure to create art on a daily basis. Um, my art has a strong focus on 3D elements and crafting. Um, I like taking a basic item and transforming it into something like ethereal and beautiful and different. Um, I've made stools, sculptures, chests, and I'm known actually for jars. I take old, um, like, recycled jars and turn them into something. Um, so that's a big one. I'll actually be showing that a little later today. But I also like painting on canvases, collaging, creative writing, and sometimes even expressing myself through my fashion, which I feel like can be an art in itself. Um, OK, and my biggest piece of advice to artists out there is to let go and reach outside of what you think art can be or what art looks like. Um, you know, I really believe that expression itself is what makes art you know, and there's no wrong way to make art and your art will always be appreciated by someone out there because it means something. Uh, creativity has infinite forms and just keep going and keep creating. Um, I think all art has value. And, you know, it's, it's not always just about how neat or precise or even like talented with your hand you are. It's really about getting that out there and art will give back to you. Art will make you feel something. You're not just putting something out, you're getting something back. Um, Okay, and then I kind of prepared some of my art to share. I don't know if we're doing that now or after. Now is okay? Okay. So um, I took a couple of more 3D elements because I felt like I was talking so much about that I kind of had to. Um, so this is actually one of the stools I made. Um, I, so I know I said rainbows were kind of my thing. This is the rainbow. And it's like a kind of like a fairy themed stool, like very mystical fairy tale. Um, this is a box I made a while ago. I really like mandalas. I had this long-term like obsession with mandalas. Uh, so there was that. Um, this is a Canva piece. Like there are some, you know, unique elements in it. It's not just like painted. It is painted, but not completely. Um, what I really like about this one is it is like a self-reflection reflection piece. Sorry. Um, so I added some, you know, some things in here if you look up close, but Really, it's about kind of like these hands clawing out of this eye, kind of representing this deep inner world and struggle that's beyond what you're seeing in just the eye. So that was kind of the theme beyond that. And then finally, the last thing I want to show, which I'm going to turn on right now because uh, there's a little light in it. But as I said, I'm known for my jars. So I felt like I had to show a jar. Um, let's see. Here we go. So it's a fairy jar. Um, and it, I put like actual fairy lights in it. Um, so, you know, there, there is definitely a theme with like rainbows, fairy tale things, uh, magical, celestial, glitter, vibrance, um, you know, and I, I think that in my journey, like what I've discovered is that is who I am and I love who I am and I'm not gonna hold it back anymore. So um, thank you so much for allowing me to show my art and that is it for me. <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you, Lauren, for also showing us your art. I, I love this. <laughs> it's so magical and mystical. 
Thank um, you. That was really, really great. So um, now moving on to Kaylee Pezzi. Um, so I'm going to have Kaylee introduce herself and, and kind of just dive right in. So take it away, Kaylee. Hi, I'm Kaylee. I am currently living in Bristol, Rhode Island with my wonderful husband. I earned my MFA in poetry in 2010 from Leslie University. I have been a poet since I could form words. I was lucky that my grandmother, much like you, Lauren, encouraged uh, my writing early on and she put it on her fridge and the rest was history. It was like igniting a fire in me and that passion for poetry has sustained me really through every mental health challenge and just being a human being. So I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder in my late twenties. I always knew something was a bit off. I struggled with emotional regulation, abandonment and self-harm. Being a poet has been instrumental in my healing process. It has allowed me to practice self-awareness as well as process trauma. I can't think of a better gift to give myself and others than to put my feelings and emotions into words. Um, and what else can I tell you? <laughs> I'm really here as a poet to fight for those that have felt invisible uh, because with my words, I can really show up for others in a way that maybe people weren't able to show up for me. Um, and I do have a poem that I can read to all of you, um, just so you have an idea of my art, and then we can move on to Q&A. So it's called Abandon Abandoning Autumn, and I wrote this when I was in undergrad, and it was published about a year ago. In a rented kitchen in front of Thames Street, I cooked you dinner. The cars pass by slow, one by one, down the narrow, memoried street. A one-way sign you came in from the cold after passing a steely black sea under a suicidal bridge. You talked of someone new. He was 6,000 miles away. You thought you were crazy, but I knew I wanted love, the way the snow looks before footprints stamp it down, a treaded mess. I made coffee, double checking the filter the way I double check our friendship for fear it would spill out everywhere and we would find ourselves unable to collect the coffee grounds. The music in the bar blared. We didn't hear it. Two women, a tiled kitchen table, the window foggy, laughter and dancing drunks downstairs. We planned our dreams. Thank you everyone for your time. Well, thank you, Kaylee. Um, it's so lovely how each of you has a different expression of your art. It's so unique and different. And I think everyone can take something away from each of it. Um, so I'll start with uh, Alyssa. So Alyssa, I, you touched upon social media, which is a huge expression of self, art, and everything nowadays. Everybody's on it. And I've gotten a lot of feedback um, from people that live with BPD and don't live with BPD that social media can be triggering, as we all know. And so as somebody with such a following and um, you're doing such amazing work, work for people that really need it, what about when you get the comments that are just not right and are negative? Well, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up. And personally, for my own mental health, I have or well, in theory, I have parameters around my social media use that would really be ideal. Um, because going on uh, social media can certainly be triggering. And, uh, you know, I would say that one, it's sort of by, um, you know, by creating content, I get to um, direct the conversation. And I get to put out content that is hopeful and encouraging and validating. So in that way, I'm directing the conversation. Um, but if and, but if you're not a content creator, I think that it can be very important. You know, I, I've heard from a lot of my followers where after the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp trial, you know, you know, I just want to say there is a lot of supportive content online for people with BPD and a lot of growing communities. You know, but I know that a, a lot of people, if they see one or two negative comments, it might be really hard for them and they'll they'll kind of focus on that. Um, 
and even on my own account, I have had some negative comments. And I honestly, for the most part, if I think that it's not like a malicious comment or anything of that nature, I try to respond to it with compassion and respect and, um, you know, be a role model in that regard. And, you know, sometimes then it'll lead to these side conversations where, you know, I'll notice other followers start attacking that person who posted something that might seem negative and off-putting. And... I really, I really try not to, to have that. And, and I even had this happen recently and I saw that the, um, the person who made the original comment, um, I guess ended up going back in and deleting their comment, their original comment that kind of triggered some people. You know, I, I, I want us to lead by example. I want us to show that we can be a compassionate, kind, intelligent, you know, uh, that we are, we are those things as a community. And so I just try to put out there, um, you know, positivity and, uh, and stay away from, from, from the negative negativity. That's wonderful. Yeah. I think it's, it's quite challenging. I think it takes experience, but really that focus on your impact on others is just, it goes a longer way than focusing on the negative, of course. Um, so Lauren, I, I, you're doing such wonderful art projects and I know they take a lot of time and probably a lot of people on this call are like, I don't have a lot of time. And so how do you prioritize? Do you, you know, like I heard that you said that you have, you had weekly meetings with friends to make art, yeah. kind of like use that as a motivating factor or what do you do? Yeah. So, um, you know, I had referenced structure in my life and feeling like it was grounding. And I think that in having a routine or specific set time that you know you're going to be doing that art, it's easier to stick to it and be consistent and, you know, commit to it. I feel like if you're like, yeah, I'll do art when I can, um, it's a little more difficult. You know, if that's if that's okay with you and, and that works for you, then go for it. But for me, I know I have to hold myself accountable and be like, no, at this exact time, I'm going to make this time and set this aside. And it, it really is self-care as a, more than anything else. So, you know, it's kind of like how, how we cultivate our self-care in all other areas of our life. Like, no, like I'm, ex I'm exhausted. I have to take a shower right now. No, like I need to go to therapy. Um, I, I, I'm like, I don't feel like talking about my feelings, but I'm going to do it. So I think for me, it's, it's about, you know, carving out that time and it does not have to be a full day, full night. It could be an hour. It could be less if that's all you can do. Um, but for me, I find it's something to look forward to. And if I'm having a rough week, I'm like, you know, my craft night's coming up and that's a place where I can express myself, um, you know, bond with another person, like, and just make something that makes me feel good and hopefully makes other people feel good too. So, um, that's kind of how I make the time. Yes, it is. It is hectic and I don't always get to it. It's not, you know, every week perfect. There are weeks where I'm like, I have no time for this, but I do what I can. So. Yeah, I think it's really key to schedule it. Even if you have to put like something in your calendar, so you block it off, you don't make other plans. It's, it's really key. Um, yeah. So Kaylee, uh, your poetry is so inspiring. It's beautiful. And the fact that you were inspired at such a young age, um, a lot of people find their inspirations in different time periods of their life. And for people that are wanting to explore the arts, what advice do you have for them as far as like how to start, where to start? Oh, I say go for it. If there's even a tiny inkling of being curious about something like painting, say you love painting, you love the subject, you love visiting museums, looking at paintings, and you really want to try, go for it. Paint a buoy. I actually recently just painted a buoy that I found on the beach for my mother as a gift for Mother's Day. <laughs> and um, I had a great time with it. It didn't have to be perfect. In fact, the buoy itself was cracked. So that's a great thing. Um, and poetry really allowed me to go out and try other things. I actually did go to beauty school at one point and learn how to be a manicurist. And I think nail art is a great mindful tool and a great form of expression. Um, so that was an exciting time. And I do try to keep up with it, but I'm not that great at nail art. Um, I'm definitely a poet <laughs> that I can attest to. Yeah, I think it just speaks to how vast and full of potential the art world is, right? You never know. You can find 
a rotten piece of wood and you can make something amazing with that, like a piece of furniture or something. So yeah, um, that's awesome. So we have some questions in the chat. Um, so Katie uh, asked, would you all talk a little bit about your interactions with therapists, mental health providers as people with BPD? What could a therapist do that would make you feel safe and understood? So anyone can jump in and answer. Wow, that's, that's such a really great question. And, um, you know, I, I, I can speak a little bit to that. I can just say where I, I feel like in the past I've had therapists who, um, now my, my current therapist is awesome. I've had a therapist for the past three years, the same therapist. Um, but before that, I had therapists who I feel like weren't that effective. It was before my BPD diagnosis. Um, they, they weren't particularly effective and, you know, she must've known I had BPD. Um, I had a therapist for about four years and I'm just imagining, I, I imagine she knew I had BPD as I was really symptomatic and had a lot of the clear cut symptoms. Um, but I never received a diagnosis and, you know, I think for a long time, I, you know, and even if it was another therapist, I think for a long time, if there was an issue in therapy, I kind of blamed it on myself. And I would always put my therapist on a pedestal. And if there was something that wasn't working, I would kind of look at myself or I would try to like twist myself into knots, like trying to do what the therapist suggested. And, you know, it's great to be willing, it's great to be dedicated to your therapy, but ultimately if you're not like seeing improvement, um, then it may not be that helpful. So I would, I'm a big believer in trusting your intuition and, and, you know, listening to kind of in DBT, what we call is wise mind. And so, um, you know, I, I wish I had listened to that earlier and listened to those things within me that were saying this, this isn't a fit, this isn't working. And so what could you do to, you know, you, your intuition will hopefully signal to you whether or not you're feeling safe and understood. And I would just say to, um, to trust that. And, um, and also I would just say based off of the, the last question and what Kaylee was saying and what Lauren was saying was that um, with any artistic endeavor, just get started. Absolutely. Just get started. You know, because my whole life I had been a writer, I had been a, also a poet and um, wrote poetry. I never thought that Instagram would become this like artistic expression for me in a place of advocacy and connection. And I literally just started making these random memes. And I, you know, I sent it to my therapist, but like that was the only person. And I'm like, okay, I need to like broaden my, uh, my base here. So I would just say get started. I never knew that my Instagram account would become like a part of my life. And, and it did. So, you know, just take that first step in whatever your um, interest might be. That's great advice. Um, does anyone else have anything to add? Um, much like Alyssa, I spent a long time with a therapist and I was so focused on proving to her that I was well, that I missed the mark on growing and changing. And after being saturated and being stuck, I was like, I need to find something else. And at the time, because I'm a bit older, um, there weren't DBT programs widely accessible around Massachusetts or anything like that where I was living at the time. DBT wasn't even really on the radar, thankfully, with Google and the internet the way it is now. <laughs> it's like an amazing uh, adventure on finding people and connections and things like that so I finally was just like I need to go somewhere else and she was like okay I was like do you know what I have and she goes yeah I just didn't want to tell you because I didn't you know want you to be feel judged or be stigmatized and actually when I found out what I had, it was liberating. I actually, it actually allowed me to skyrocket, find the right modality for my journey and heal and have a life worth living like we've heard before, so. Yeah, I, I just wanna say like as a therapist, it's very frustrating that like a lot of therapists are scared of even giving diagnoses or, or labeling someone because 
once you put that label in, it's like that stigma is there and it, it creates a second problem. There's the initial diagnosis and then what you're carrying after you're diagnosed with that. And it's like, you know, in the end, your therapist was like looking out for you, right? Like she didn't want to make more damage, but in the end, like you needed that label to understand yourself so that you didn't feel like, like what's going on. I don't understand why I feel this way, why I'm going through this. Um, so, you know, I feel like it's also the job of therapists and, and even activists like us, like working to break down this stigma every day as much as we can, because it's so damaging. And then we have situations like the Johnny Depp case where it's very upsetting because of all the misinformation that's being spread and like more of a negative label put around this. Um, but what's interesting is both of you guys were talking about how you felt so nervous to do something wrong and to like make the therapist feel comfortable. Meanwhile, like the diagnosis has the stigma of being like not caring about other people. And in reality, you guys have both exemplified just how that's so untrue. Like you're very caring, empathetic. Like you think of others, you want to connect. So, you know, I, I think that's just a really good example of what's going on today and how it could be so pervasive. So, yeah. Yeah, I think the recurring theme is consistently the stigma and mm -hmm. how to cope with it. And it's it's really important to actually address that with your therapist if you feel comfortable to just, because that is the second element that you're dealing with. You're dealing with the internal struggle, but then that external struggle, which is so, so heavy. And it's important to bring that up in your support groups and your therapy sessions to see what ways you can navigate this. And, you know, mm -hmm. aren't really... It breaks barriers. I think it breaks political barriers, cultural barriers, and all the other stigma barriers, right? So this expression is universal, and that's why it's so, so powerful. And I'm so happy that you all are here today to show what you're doing and courageously doing it um, out in the open. So I think um, uh, you know everybody can take away something from this. And my question was, do you all kind of... Um, talk about your art in therapy, like has that actually helped the therapeutic relationship and progress with therapy sessions? I'd say when I was in the, the thick of it, uh, when I was doing DBT heavy work, um, my poetry definitely helped explain where I was at different moments and explain the harder things that I wasn't sure I had words to describe when I was in a session maybe, or when I did DBT group therapy, it allowed me to um, give an example to others who maybe didn't have words for what they were experiencing internally because so much of BPD experiences are dark nights of the mind, the soul. It's so internally or like constantly in a struggle with the self and trying to figure out who the self is. So. I think that at different times for different reasons, my poetry definitely helped others as well as myself and my therapist. Um, and I had a therapist that welcomed reading my work before a session. Um, of course, I worried about boundaries because of the stigma. Um, now that I'm in EMDR, it's a lot less you know, using words and more, even more healing and transcending trauma. So it, it depends on where you are in your journey, how the art helps. Yeah, I I have shared my uh, my poetry. I, I recently did an open mic night, and I uh, I shared a poem uh, with my therapist, and um, I thought that went really well. I, I have a very brief poem I can share quickly, if you like. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. I just recently wrote it. Uh, it's titled uh, "Mental Illness." When I'm alone. There's this sound of white noise. Can you hear it? It fills the room with trauma and unbearable pain. My mind fractures and dissociates. But enough about me. How about you? And yes, this is a lovely dinner party too. So that that's just a little poem that I wrote that can kind of explain, you know, with humor, um, some of the things that, um, you know, just express that part of myself. And I, I just want to say, like, um, I'm actually, I, I have to ha hop off, I believe, because at 2.15, there's a stigma panel I'm on. But thank you so much for letting me part be part of this one. Thank you. Thank Alyssa. you. It was great having you. All right. So we're four minutes shy of the end of this session. Um, 
Does anyone have any other questions? It, please chat away, uh, put it in the box, the chat box. We'd love to hear it. Um, I think uh, yeah, there's so many amazing components to this. And the other component is just being able to express what you can't express verbally, right? It's almost like there's a there's a more element of comfort when you can just do it through art um, and leave it, you know, kind of out there to the interpreter's perception. So I think, um, yeah, it's, it's it's such a beautiful component. So it looks like, let me just breeze through and see if I missed anything a little bit earlier today. It looks like. Um, okay, so Victoria. Uh, oh. Okay, so let me just read through. We just got a couple of comments at uh, the same time. Um, okay, uh, so Victoria has a question. Any suggestion on how to deal with the impatience, perfectionism, and I am not good enough feeling when trying to learn a new artistic field? Like so this? to preface this, I did answer her, but privately, because I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be private, because it was per in parentheses, it said private. So oh. I'm assuming since you read it, it was not just private. So I'll just reiterate what I sent back. But essentially, I was saying, like, create for you. Um, don't think about what someone else would like. Don't think of any specific standard. Uh, start with nothing and just see where it goes. And also, like, turn your mistakes into something else. Uh, use that as just another pathway for. I said, do not make comparisons. And I do want to say this goes for everything in life. Making comparisons is never a good thing. Um, and then I just kind of said, let the colors and aesthetics you like be your guide. So just like, what colors do you like? What designs do you like? What medias do you like? Just play around. Think of it as like a fun experiment. And again, there's no wrong way to do this. Um, but I can understand that if you're perfectionistic in like a lot of areas of your life, it can, it can it usually does translate to art, especially because our original idea of art is so perfect and neat. And, you know, I know every art teacher I ever had was very strict and wanted a specific way and i had to get outside of that to really come into my art so that would be my advice but i hope that you make art <laughs> so great any other comments kaylee um i'd say treat art like you treat yourself have compassion mm. be curious and have fun i mean you're you're an explorer you're exploring writing or painting or music I mean, even just listening to music is a form of art, in my opinion. So it's like anything that's a connector to the self and to others. So you, maybe there's fear around exploring those things, and maybe it's time to explore that fear. Maybe it isn't perfectionism. But, you know, have compassion with your questions and go forward and have fun above all else. Great advice. Well, thank you both so much for inspiring us. And thank you everybody for joining us, your questions, your participation. Um, we hope to see you at some time down the road. All right, have a great day. Thanks, and enjoy. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.